I'm really appreciative of everybody coming on board. I think it's going to be interesting and I think we should identify some future get-togethers on more specific subject matter but we've taken as broad a topic as possible today to allow uh, a lot of, of things that are happening to be put on the table and, and identified as they're significant going forward. Uh, right, Andrew, are you ready to take command? Yeah, so thanks very much, Peter. In terms of the actual format, um, we've got, I think, I think four or five, um, we would normally in a conference environment, we might call speakers who will give um, just a, a quick three minute rundown of some of the issues. Um, and remember the topic is, what are we learning for the future of transport from the COVID-19 crisis? So um, that's, and then it will um, just turn into a discussion. So we've got uh, five um, people who I'm just gonna invite to say a few words about coronavirus. And I think at this stage, you know, there's, there's, there's an, so much uncertainty about that there's obviously a very clear picture on what's what's happening on travel demand at the moment um there are anecdotes i'm sure galore which will be interesting to hear as well from people about how they're coping or how they're responding or whatever and then of course there's also the the longer term issues on what this does really mean for transport in which we will you know we can speculate and we can we can hazard guesses so um, let me start. I think Peter Jones from University College London is with us. Peter, do you want to um, say a few words? And if we can limit it to about three minutes, Max. Sure. Okay, thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, just to say three or four things. Uh, I mean, the first is that the very headline figures are that rail travel has gone down around 95%, including the underground. I think bus traffic has gone down 80, 85%, but general traffic has gone down less. And I think there's probably two things going on there. One is that um, uh, the longer distance trips are far fewer, which tend to be rail based and so on. So more of the trips left are local ones. Obviously, freight is a very important element on the road. But I suspect that um, car use, private car use, has probably dropped less than um, public transport use. And I think there's probably two reasons for that. One is that um, there are concerns about uh, catching the virus on public transport, whereas in your own vehicle, people feel uh, much safer and fairly impregnable. And also because of the cutbacks in public transport services, um, then perhaps there's less opportunity to use public transport. And I, and I think going to the longer term, it may reinforce many people's views that they need a car, A, because if there are any other problems in the future in terms of infections or health, but also because they can't rely on certain aspects of public transport because they get severely cut back. And I think there might be a negative thing there in the future in terms of trying to reduce people, uh, getting people to reduce car use. Um, the other thing that obviously we're not focused on because we're local transport today, but I think it's really important is that transport's a derived demand. So essentially the reason we're seeing the reduction in demand for travel is at one level because we're told not to go out, but also because we're still doing many of the things we did do, but we're doing them differently. And it'd be really interesting to look at some of these crossovers about how much internet use is going up uh, at the same time, how much electricity demand perhaps is going up, um, how people are meeting retail needs separately and, and so on. I mean, we've heard Sainsbury's and people say, oh, there's a big extra demand for shopping, people are hoarding. But in a sense, people can't go out to restaurants and pubs. So to some extent, it's shifting from the wholesale to the retail market. And these quite interesting changes going on. And in terms of, I think, if this would have happened 10 years ago, I think we've been in a very different situation. I think what's happened over the last 10 or 20 years that have made the current situation more livable for many people is one internet that we can have this discussion and do so much on internet, including ordering goods and services that we couldn't have done in the same way 10 or 20 years ago, and actually having a very efficient and dynamic logistics system. And so I think going into the future, the implications of that are likely to be that we do find we can make more use of internet for meetings and things and therefore need to have less face-to-face -face business meetings, perhaps working from home one or two days a week. Um, and also on the logistics side, the fact that people have got used to, uh, well, two things there. One is people have got used to ordering more things online. So again, there may be more of that in the future. And secondly, there's obviously a lot of restructuring of logistics chains going on uh, being worried about international supply chains that are very vulnerable. So you may find some reorganization of supply chains, which will affect the patterns of freight movement in this country in the future. Thank you. 
That's very interesting. Thanks, Peter. Um, now let's go to uh, Richard Walker. Um, Richard, you're on sabbatical from the DFT, I believe. Um, do you want to just explain a little about your perspective? Sure. Hi, hi, everybody. Am I am I now centre stage, uh, Andrew? You are. I'm not on my own screen, but uh, anyway. So hi. So uh, some of you will know me as a Department for Transport civil servant. Some of you might remember me from my previous life as one of a chair of Transport Planning Society and so on. Um, I'm on secondment uh, at the moment to uh, Leeds University Institute of Transport Studies, something called the Decarbonate uh, uh, Network Project which is about um, decarbonizing the transport system and doing a better job on that than we've been doing. And uh, the N8 actually stands for the N8 Group of Northern Research Universities. So it's a, a multifaceted uh, research program, but the, the, the Leeds ITS strand of that is transport demand. So, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. However, um, civil servants on secondment remain civil servants and um, it's customary to say things like the government's got this in hand and everything's under control and I know that uh, my colleagues are working extremely hard to uh, respond to the crisis. Um, I think it's helped a little bit that um, the DFT was gearing up for a crisis to hit sort of fragile supply chains and things like this uh, in the context of no deal Brexit and I think they've been able to repurpose quite a lot of the teams they had ready for that to um, help with this particular crisis. Um, I'm just, I don't know how far into my three minutes I've got, but I've just got a couple of points about where this, what this means for the future of transport. I mean, the first one is that um, it is massive. Um, the financial hit is extremely unevenly distributed. So that those of us in the public sector who enjoy a sort of iron rice bowl uh, need to be aware that people in the private sector and the voluntary sector um, have had massive hits to their income stream, and, and, and those organisations don't have the deep pockets necessarily to survive the crisis. So um, the government's obviously put a lot of stuff in place to, to um, help with that, but it's still a big difference in between people who've seen almost all their revenue go and people who's, who, for whom the crisis is just a matter of having to learn to work from home. So um, I just wanted to make that point and hopefully it'll come up in, in conversation. And my, my other one very quickly is with a decarbonate perspective. I've written a blog piece for Decarbonate and, and people might wish to read it, but it's basically saying that I came into transport planning to make towns and, and, and the places we live better places to be and not as uh, overrun with car traffic. And, um, and I've always felt that went with the grain of saving the planet and decarbonizing, uh, cutting greenhouse gas emissions. But over 30 years, we haven't made much progress and we've consistently let uh, other crises deemed to be more urgent get in the way of doing things about decarbonizing transport and uh, in my blog piece I pick up 9-11 and the war on terror and all that kind of stuff and then the 2008 crash and uh, certainly um, in the recession that followed the financial crash of 2008 it was felt that it'd be a good idea to get let the economy recover before we go back to the issue of dealing with decarbonization um, and that was actually a bad move. And we can, we've now run out of time on decarbonisation. We can't afford to do that coming out of the COVID recession. We need to, um, we need to rebuild, uh, uh, you know, from, and, and the point I wanted to make was that for years, transport carbon emissions have not gone down in this country, um, but now they have. Um, so it, all the things that we thought were difficult to do we are now probably at, I don't know, 20, 30, 40% of the carbon emissions from transport that we were a month ago. That's exactly where we thought we needed to be by 2030. And we're already here, but the economy is obviously in massive trouble. But uh, so, uh, but decarbonate, we're kicking, and we don't have the answer yet, but we're kicking around the idea of a climate smart recovery. So we want the economy to recover from, from this um, uh, lockdown crisis and recession, but we don't want carbon emissions from transport to recover in the same way. And that's going to be a big deal and it's going to require a lot of thinking and a lot of changes to the way we do things. But I just want to put that on the table. We're already where we need to be in carbon terms, but not in the economic circumstances we wish. Okay, Richard, thank you. Um, third up, uh, Cliff Edwards. Uh, I started out uh, as an IT analyst and then I went into time series analysis in the city 
Uh, so that was predictive analysis using maths and computer technology. Uh, I got a degree in psychology. I studied suicide trends in the railway for a while. Um, I now do psychometrics, uh, which is uh, questionnaires and tests. So um, I'm looking at passenger movement analysis with a company called Domo for Network Rail. And I just want to make the point that chaos theory is not chaotic. So uh, what am I doing? I'm uh, looking at the effects of coronavirus on the psychology of masses. And uh, I've got a presentation that I figure said I could run next week. Uh, but very briefly, I'll show you uh, a couple of sheets on it. Uh, I hope you can all see that now. Uh, so this is just how people's uh, meta systems affect what they do. Uh, I'm looking at uh, how uh, cultural scripts are changing. They're changing very rapidly now that we've got this, uh, as Robert Noyce says, uh, necessity is a mother of invention. So people are having to change even if they don't want to. So this is just an exploration of how people lose control and how change happens. So that's my role, if that's a, is that enough? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Cliff. And, uh, and now to uh, Keith Mitchell of, of Consultant Stantec. Keith, over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, uh, uh, very interesting. Cliff about the chaos theory. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand it, but I should be a great fan um, uh, because the situation that we're in at the moment um, it has uh, accelerated a process that we've been trying to make happen for a very long period of time, and all of a sudden it's happened outside of our control. Uh, but there, but the critical problem, as Richard was saying, is that there's all sorts of un uh, unintended consequences as a, as a result of it, uh, which we need to try and figure out a way around. I wanted to approach this really from a, a, the point of view of land use. Um, uh, Peter started actually talking about uh, transport as a derived demand, absolutely right. Um, but what we're now beginning to see is not only different ways in which we are living, uh, different ways in which we are working, but also um, within just a few weeks, beginning to see uh, changes in the in in commercial and contractual behaviour. For example, around office contracts. Uh, you know, there are people out there in the market that are, have decided that they don't need an office anymore and that they can continue to work remotely. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the available office space in our cities? Uh, that could be incredibly dramatic. Um, uh, and what would that mean if we suddenly decided that converting a lot of that accommodation into residential, what would that mean in terms of the way in which we supported our cities and our places with transport? Um, uh, those um, changes in working patterns were very, very slowly happening with more agile working. Um, but now that has you know, in our business, we suddenly have 1,700 consultants working remotely, uh, and that took place over two days. It took us about 18 months to get an agile working policy agreed. So it just <laughs> uh, necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, similarly, um, changes have been happening in the high street. We've always known there's a long way to go. Uh, and uh, we're now seeing accelerated changes into special forms of trading. Uh, uh, big changes in logistics and supply chains. And in particular, I think the point that was made earlier about risks around international supply chains leading to local sourcing and being willing to pay a premium for that and seeing local, locally sourced retail and local retailers re-emerging in our high streets is very significant. Um, so the, all of this uh, has the potential for significant changes in land use. And I take this now back to Richard Walker and your climate smart recovery, uh, because there really is an opportunity to, for, for places to reinvent themselves uh, to match the, a new way of working. It'll be a balance between where we are now and where we were before. Uh, but how do we as a profession encourage that balance to be in the right place? And how do we find the transport systems that need to support those new units of development in high streets and neighborhoods so that they're connected to a strategic network uh, 
uh, of movement that, that can be managed from a low carbon basis. Uh, local neighbourhoods and local places that are supported with the right sort of uh, uh, smart local modes and how those last mile connections work and I think we need to start getting our, our heads around a new spatial form and a new way of living and then work out how, how our transport uh, uh, systems then support it. My last comment would, would be I think that there, there is already an immense amount of data out available about this and we are going to be studying and learning from that data for a very long time uh, and I think we need to make sure that our Department for Transport and the rest of the government is collecting this data and creating an open data source for us all to be learning from including the very good decarbonate network. Thank you. Thanks very much Keith. Just on the data um, point um, I don't know if, if everyone's aware of Richard, you sent round a, a very interesting thing to me last week, an email link to um, Google communities data, which has, which has traffic data, I think collated from mobile phone, um, people, mobile phone users for, for every local authority in, in Britain by the looks of it. I haven't had a detailed look at it, but it started at Aberdeenshire and worked down. So. It's, um it's Richard here, yeah. I mean, they, they put it out there on Google for uh, 130 countries of the world, of which we are one of them. I mean, basically, what you don't realise is when you're carrying an Android phone, you're telling Google, you, you probably check a box and don't read the 80 pages of terms of conditions, but that allows you to Google to track you yeah. wherever you go. They know where, mm -hmm. and so they know how much time you're spending in different types of premises so that they can see how much more time you're spending at home and how much less time you're spending in offices in um, pleasure locations and, and in groceries and pharmacies and what have you it's incredibly um, uh, 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 you know it's, uh, it's big data it's the apotheosis of big data really and it's all there out on the net um, I, I don't know if you can I, I, can I don't know if you can send a link to it for people I don't know if that's yes, no, I'll try and do that right now yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. And um, our fifth um, panelist is Lynn Sloman. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Hi. Lynn from Transport for Quality of Life. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I think that um, I think there are some quite kind of big uh, issues which, on the face of it, aren't about transport at all, but actually they will become about transport and about how we make transport climate smart. Um, coming out of COVID, um, I think the first thing is that it may very well change our view about what transport investment is for. And I say that partly in the context of recently um, being involved in the team that's starting to do the evaluation of the Transforming Cities Fund for DFT. And one of the objectives for the Transforming Cities Fund is to increase productivity. And we've been having debates in the team about whether really increasing productivity is going to seem like the, the, the economic be all and end all after coronavirus that it has up until now. And whether actually maybe economic resilience might seem like it's a more important thing to be trying to build your transport system to enable. And that could really change the kind of investment that we, that we might do. Um, I think the other thing that in a way is quite hopeful uh, is that I think one of the things we'll learn from COVID-19 is the crucial role of government and of the public sector acting in the public in interest to tackle big problems. And I think the kind of the nature of public discourse over the last 20 or 30 years has very much been about government not being able to take on big issues leaving things to the market and i think what's so abundantly clear from coronavirus is that when you get a real emergency you need government you need the public sector to pull everything together and climate change is a slow motion emergency compared to coronavirus but it's still an emergency and i suppose in my more hopeful moments i think that the lesson that we're learning about the crucial role of the public sector um, and of government may play through into um, a, a legitimization of a bigger role for government leadership and maybe even a greater confidence from government that if government explains why big changes are necessary, 
people will understand. So I think that maybe a bigger role for leadership from government, a bigger role for the public sector might be something that we might start to see more openness towards after coronavirus. Um, at the very kind of nuts and bolts end of this, I really hope that, that, that something else that might come out of coronavirus is a recognition of transport workers at the sharp end, your bus drivers, uh, people on tube platforms as being essential workers who are deserving of more value um, and actually are deserving of better conditions and better pay. Um, and maybe we might start to recognise, you know, who are the key workers and do we need to respect and acknowledge who they are and, and reflect that in how they're reimbursed and rewarded. Um, and then I think the, the final thing um, is that clearly with the amount of money that's being spent now, um, big investment in transport that is non-essential may come under increasing scrutiny. And I'm thinking particularly of things like the £27 billion second road investment strategy, um, which, you know, at one level, billed as the largest ever road programme, is really a bit of a vanity project um, and doesn't sit comfortably with the DFT decarbonise, work towards a decarbonisation plan. Um, and I hope that some of these big projects that actually don't meet the big challenges of our time will come under a bit of um, question and scrutiny and we'll be starting to say, given that we don't have lots of money, should we really be spending it like this or should we be spending it in a more effective way to meet the big carbon challenge? That's it from me. Lynn, that's an uh, excellent analysis. Thank you ever so much. That's really great. Um, I've got a few kind of ideas in my head, but we're also getting some people using the Zoom uh, chat. I don't know if, if, if everyone's familiar with the chat, if you're not familiar with it, just go down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little chat button. And if you type, uh, use that, you can message everyone or, or me or, or, or just one of the participants. Um, so uh, Roger French, Roger, you, you had a, um, just one thing you wanted to pick up on, I think it was Peter's comments, was it? Yes, thank, thanks, Andrew. Just a very small point on Peter's excellent two issues about the dramatic fall off in public transport use. Obviously, the, the government's restrictions on travel are there, but he, he mentioned uh, concerns about catching the virus on buses and trains and also the severe cutback in services, particularly on buses. But I just want to share with you, if it works, this, um, this screen, which shows the... Has that happened? Yeah which shows a tweet from uh, 10 Downing Street. I didn't think ever in my lifetime career in public transport I would see a tweet along these lines. But sadly, I think um, that the idea of avoiding public transport is going to need a quick, sharp change when this is over back to using public transport, because otherwise, with petrol coming down to almost a pound a litre now, and people are going to think, hey, the roads are clear, there's no congestion, Petrol is dirt cheap, let's get back in the cars and within a very short space of time we'll have congestion back to what it was. Meanwhile, we'll have bus companies absolutely financially strapped uh, with cash, not being able to put frequencies back to what they were. And uh, I agree with everything all the speakers have said and, and Lynn's excellent points as well. But I, I, I am worried about the immediate short term before we get to the medium to longer term. Thanks. That's that's very interesting. I mean, the, the 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 message I've picked up is that there's not going to be a hard and fast end to coronavirus being a problem in in in, in society, and that it, it it's it's going to go on being a concern for quite a considerable time. So I guess that comes back to the point you're making, Roger, about or, or, and also Peter about um, what the public perception of using public transport will be, not only during the lockdown, uh, not only the short term lockdown period, but afterwards. Um, right. Uh, I tell you, I was just wondering whether, I know we've got some people, um, uh, I was speaking to uh, Lillian uh, Burns earlier on, I think she's with us today, um, and she lives in a, a village in, I think, Cheshire, 
and I know we've got some people from uh, High Trans as well. Hello, High Trans. In fact, probably three more than more than anyone else, I suspect. That's great representation. Thanks ever so much um, for joining in. Um, I thought maybe there'd be some kind of interesting views from you know what the picture of rural. We've heard lots about uh, what it's like in in city transport. We've seen the massive reduction in in bus use and train use and 50% reduction in road traffic on London's roads. But I was wondering rural areas, um, Lillian maybe wants to start or High Trans if they want to say anything. Um, I was talking to Lillian about getting home deliveries earlier on um, and the, the difficulty that it is to actually, uh, if you don't have access to a car, to get your shopping. Lillian, do you want to join in on that first? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Um, sorry, I was having trouble with the visuals. I don't know. Don't worry about that. Um, okay. Well, I was merely explaining to you that um, unless you can now prove uh, that you're a particularly needy case, uh, you cannot get home deliveries. So on the one hand, you have individuals, particularly those 70 and over, who are being uh, told to stay in the homes. Uh, but if they, aren't, uh, if they can't prove they're a particularly needy case, there is an issue there. So you go online to try and get a, a home delivery and the supermarkets are totally uh, booked out. Uh, most of the ones I've looked at um, uh, take you up to about the end of August. So you're getting into autumn and there's still no uh, services available. Uh, so then you think, oh, I've had a bright idea. I'll try a local dairy company. Well, of course, the, you won't be surprised to hear that the dairy companies who have had major problems for years now uh, with uh, declining demand, suddenly they're getting hundreds of inquiries a day. Will you put me back on your delivery? And can you also deliver to me other dairy products? And they're struggling. So you have this issue of people, particularly in rural areas, with a, a, an impossible situation so they're having to, if you will, defy the regulations to go out and shop. Um, so it was just, I was just discussing that with you uh, earlier and you said, well, bring it up. So I've, I've Absolutely. No, I think it's an important, it's an important point. And, and uh, uh, you know, the delivery companies, I, I suspect the, the supermarkets and all that will see this as an opportunity to, to expand their delivery services. But in the short term, they can't actually they can't actually meet the demand they can't no because of course like everybody else they're also having the problem of uh, the number of, of employees who aren't available because they're self-isolating or because they've got the virus so instead of being able to up their production that they, they can't it, it just isn't there in the supply chain at such short notice the people they need and the products and can I ask the, uh, someone from High Trans, just, you know, public transport availability in the Highlands is, is sparse at the best of times. What's it like in, in, at this time? What's, is there any? Hi, hi everybody. I'm Ronald Robertson. And apologies that we're uh, squatting on this call a bit. Uh, my colleague Frank shared Andrew's email, so um, we're guilty on Great that to see you. Front. Brilliant um, to see you. Thank hi, you. Hi, pleased to see everybody. And, um, the, the, you know, the reason we were so interested was because we, we are very alive to, to these challenges and these issues. Maybe just to, to highlight that this is, um, you know, that this current crisis and the lockdown impacts are no respecter of modes. Um, I was on a call yesterday um, where we were discussing the impact it's having on ferry services within within our, the Highlands and Islands. Um, generally speaking, we've, we've, we've seen a past decline of 95% on our ferry service. But for the, the forthcoming Easter weekend, um, numbers are forecast to be 3% of what they would be on, a, on an Easter weekend under normal circumstances. So it's, it's, you know, it's actually really stark and evident in, in that context as well, where we're, um, you know, the message is very much stay home, save lives as well. Um, but again, I think the, there will be a, a leveling off that wouldn't happen in the same way. And I completely agree with Roger French's point that, you know, we really need to act fast to make sure that we, we address the, the impact and the perception that people may form um, around bus use in particular, but also rail use. So we, we are trying to have a look um, in collective effort terms, um, working with our 
partners through the Public Health Scotland as well to understand how we manage to provide those messages of reassurance. But a lot of what we were hoping to get from today was trying, you know, share share the, the the understanding that's coming out from from other parts of the country because we're all facing similar challenges. Um, but yes, but you know. Part of what we've done in terms of pivoting in our rural areas is um, we, we have a, a small demand responsive transport service in the Isle of Skye, and we've moved that from passenger use to it's doing uh, food and prescription deliveries in, in its local community as well. So there are short-term measures that we are taking as well in a you know in a very rural basis that I know are happening. Our, our you know the largest independent bus operator in our area is doing some of that. That's West Coast Motors, the Campbelltown Group, um, but also you know. The, the you know the other you know there are other really good examples of what people are doing to try and um, you know connect well with their communities um, during this, but um, it's it's how we ensure that those communities come back to our transport services um, after all of this as well and don't you know we 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 recognise Zoom has you know come along we're all managing to make today work um, there'll be a lot more of us using I think these these um, means of uh, doing our business without you know then having to travel so reducing the need to travel and that's a good thing but again there will be knock-on impacts on on um, transport services that are either being secured by fare box revenue or being secured by um, public subvention so we, we we do need to have a real plan and uh, you know that that is uh, put into play very very quickly right thank, thank you very much um, that, 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 that's great um, I'm just looking down the the questions. Um, Graham, Graham Smith, you've sent you've sent in a question. Um, do you just want to go through it? Um, I'm just trying to see. It is directly related to COVID, is it? <laughs> <laughs> isn't isn't everything related to COVID? I was okay. Go on then. Focus the question. Uh, to um, uh, Keith Mitchell and to um, and to a young man that I remember, I think from Oxford Brooks or even Oxford Polytechnic, uh, to Richard Walker, um, saying that if you want um, more local accessibility and less use of cars, then Manual for Streets is 13 years since its publication, and according to the Urban Design Group's own mini survey no highway authority in the country we estimate is actually conforming to manual for streets in terms of uh, connectivity and local high streets and abolishing distributor roads so the request is to recover from covid and not to start using our cars more um, we must shoot anybody who uses design bulletin 32 <laughs> with a large gun <coughs> as quickly as possible thank right. you i don't know if anyone is can there... i come in on that one yeah uh, okay yeah i am indeed i do remember you well graham it's nice to see you looking very well and hardly looking a year older after 30 years since i was old slightly different color hair yes <laughs> um so i mean is well just related point i mean I wonder if, and, and I think the transport planning community should at least debate this, is that uh, the traffic's gone from the streets at the moment. Uh, John Dales, I think, on this call showed a, a photo of people repainting the Abbey Road uh, zebra crossing um, from 50, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, um, because it's not been possible to do it because of the crowds, but it now is. Um, but I wonder, and we've been discussing this at Decarbonate as well, is that it, can this uh, opportunity be used to put some facts on the ground in terms of road space reallocation? So, um, it, it, you know, could we move widen pavements, uh, introduce bus gates in town centres and do all these things now because they'll work um, in the next six months because there won't be much traffic about. Um, and then when the, the situation recovers, that you've got a fait accompli, you know, and it's just worth us debating that um mm -hmm. because uh, i think as, as roger made roger french made a very true point that um buses are going to find it really hard to to build confidence in the market again so we've got to build in some advantages to them um now you know um for, for the future um circumstance and the other thing i would just also mention is 
I mean, cycling is a great way to get around uh, whilst you're social distancing, but um, it's not compatible with the fact that a lot of people are using the empty roads to, to speed up. And there's a lot of cars racing around here in London. And I hear it's the same in Leeds and I'm sure it's the same in a lot of places. Um, and we can't just allow the drop in traffic to allow average traffic speeds in urban streets to go up. I mean, that would be a big waste. Right. Um, just before I go on to the next one, I've got an observation I've, I've made myself from this, which is this is 10 times more fun than editing a magazine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, it's Keith here. I could see John Dales was waving his hand at that. Ah, OK. Um, right. Uh, and while he's just preparing himself for that, I did yeah. do a little response to Graham. But this, yes. is a, this is a moment in time where we can't miss this opportunity. Uh, and tying those two things together, I, you know, we ought to be reclaiming the space as quickly as we possibly can uh, and using this as an opportunity to learn from what happens when you do that. And we can reevaluate what trips are really necessary because we're demonstrating that a lot of the trips we were making clearly aren't because here we are. OK, Steve Gooding. Steve, hello. Steve, RAC Foundation Director. Uh, are you with us? He may be on mute, but he's he's given me a he he oh, says it like I'm, I'm here. Yes, we can hear can you now. Do you want to chip in? Yeah. Hello. Hello, yeah. great. Thank Hi, you. Steve. Um, very sorry because my complete inability to recognise which link to click on in the first place. That's fine. First quarter of the meeting, clicking on the wrong meeting. But there we go. We'll learn. I'll learn as well. Um the various things I the main thing I want to chip in to the this is several people I've heard have said we must do this and we must do that. And my slightly cynical observation is that we are quite a self-selecting bunch on this uh, conference. And I think we've really got to think about the other folk who need to be persuaded that doing something different is the right thing to do. I guarantee you, sitting in the Treasury building right this second, somebody saying, I don't care what you think, we aren't about to start subsidising buses big time, other than to get people through the C-19 crisis as a, a general protection to businesses. They'll be thinking similarly, we've got the Williams Review here, there'll be somebody in the Treasury who thinks that the railway should pay its way. And I think we've got to turn our minds, not just to what people on this call might like to think the future should look like, but as I said in my Transport Times piece, we've got to think about what's got to be true to make it so. So one of the things I'd really like to push for in this period however many weeks it turns out to be, is let's take a deep breath and take another good hard look, not just at the manual for streets, but let's take a good hard look at EPTAG. Let's ask ourselves, are we putting the values we care about in the right way into the equations of what we should do? Otherwise, when, for example, we say, we need to tempt our buses back, we need to help them out, why don't we do something about the road layout? Many of us are going to find ourselves in local authority places where the received wisdom is, yeah, 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 but what we really want to do is get the economy moving again. That means make, take off the parking restrictions, get everyone back to the shops, because that's how a lot of people are going to be thinking. I mean, personally, I can't wait to get out again. And I can't wait to get out again on, on two wheels, and that's two wheels with a motor. Right, yes. I mean, I've certainly picked up one or two authorities, um, councils this week talking about what they're going to do post-COVID-19 on parking, for instance, and they're going to sit there saying we need to have uh, no parking charges for some length of time to, to get people back to the shops. So I guess that matches your, your point. Thank you. Um, now, John Dales, am I saying, seeing you want to say something? Yeah, John. saying there Andrew is what everybody always says right is that you know we've got a we've got a crisis in the high streets so and make the parking free I think there's an opportunity to consider you know to actually look at current patterns and seeing how they're changed in other words one of the key things for local high streets especially is the idea that they are local high streets and actually lots more people will be walking to them now than you know people who might have used to drive and so there's some interesting um perspective upon that but actually that wasn't the point I'd raised my hand for earlier that Richard pointed to it's a phrase we've used before isn't it like we build a bypass let's lock in the new capacity or lock in those changes and I do think one of the things that's worth exploring is that idea of locking in the current different use of street space 
in in certain areas and it's you know and obviously i would say it's compliant with other policies including the uh, decarbonizing uh, transport strategy and other local strategies is this idea of um to, to taking roger's point about the urgent or the really pressing need to make sure that we are favoring buses one way of doing that um uh, assuming that Steve is and he's much more likely to be correct about this than I am is, is right about the Treasury's position on that is actually well less prioritized space let's make it easier for the, the buses to move to be more attractive we could do that for walking and cycling as well I don't know about you one of the challenges at the moment I'm finding in certain parts of the, uh, my local area is that it's you know even in fairly generous footways it's quite hard to get two meters away I'm finding myself walking in the carriageway a lot and actually, that's fine for the most part, because actually there aren't that many vehicles in the carriageway. There is space there that isn't needed there. And I suppose one of the key things, therefore, arising for me is there are, and, and other cities around the world are doing it, as I understand it, is are repurposing streets right now. They are filtering some off, you know, where there's a real, especially in the more dense cities where there's a, a, there's a shortage of um, public park space, they're making neighborhood streets quiet essentially and doing what you, you know road closures or you might get you know say the selective road closures um, they are some cities are creating short-lived bike lanes or rather they may be short-lived bike lanes but taking bike lanes now as well just using fairly simple temporary measures it's that kind of thing that i think we have the opportunity to do even right now and for the next two or three months you know uh, the, the, notwithstanding how long the the worst of this crisis lasts I suppose there's a, it seems to me there's a real opportunity to start planning now to think how will we change the allocation space going forward in ways that aren't just, oh, we can do this now. It's not just opportunistic. I think Richard's point earlier, Richard Walker's point earlier was extremely important about, yeah, but the, the economy's on its knees at the moment. That is a really important point. But actually, we are showing that we can use the space differently. Um, in cities, I'm afraid this obviously this is what we're talking about. So what I'm talking about will does apply mostly to towns and cities and not rural areas for obvious reasons. Let's take the space now because that would be good and let's keep it. Let's plan to keep it at least for a period. And let's see how that plays, you know, as things build back up, because otherwise the locking in point is it would be very easy to see people just generally going, oh, one of the great things but yes i loved it when it was quiet and clean and the air was beautiful and there were more birds in the back garden and i heard stuff that in before but <gasps> let's just it's such so reassuring to go back to normal let's make that less possible in terms of transport it seems to me okay. so the idea of locking in there you go thanks thanks john that's great and, uh, there's a couple of people are, are on questions have also had uh, uh, pointing out on this theme um Colin Black, um, any evidence, thoughts about the potential impact on active mode use um, from the current lockdown? I, I guess anecdotally, I'm seeing huge numbers of people actually walking around and, and maintaining the two meter distance, but uh, people who perhaps didn't used to uh, go out for a daily bit of exercise, they're perhaps starting to do so. Um, Chris Bureau, didn't you have your hand up? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I, a couple of things I just wanted to say. First of all, to support Steve Gooding's point, um, as a sociologist, I've been tracking Facebook and so on, and people can't wait to get out again. Look at the brochures people are receiving, their holidays, their cars, we put the ads on telly. Um, there'll be a huge surge in demand and pent up frustration, I think, afterwards. And we shouldn't assume that this green agenda is always going to. Um, hold sway. There has to be a more pessimistic view, I think, of what we're doing. If we don't take it on board, we won't. And the other thing I was going to say is on the positive side, there's such learning going on in the logistics industry and rail freight and so on. I mean, for ages we've been trying to get people to cooperate in the freight industry for backloads and things like that. Suddenly they're doing it in a way that they did in the Olympics. But we lost that legacy and, and now I think, you know, we don't want to lose that again. So both a pessimistic and an optimistic point I want to make. Cliff, Cliff uh, just going back to you, Cliff, you, you've, you've sent me a message or, or you sent a message to everyone, which seems to be saying that the majority of people will revert back to what they did before as soon as, this, as, soon as they can. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions I wanted to, come to answer on for everyone. Uh, one of them is about the, the spread of early adopters versus late adapters. 
and how that will affect the, the, the journey back into semi-normal life. Um, I want to make one dire, horrible point is that as the density of population increases, so does the potency of viruses. So this is not the end game. That this is going to happen again because our population is generally only going in one direction and the densities are where the highest uh, rate of, of virus transmission is happening. But there is a balance between the need to conform, conform and the, the desperate stress and neurosis that's coming out of this. And that's why I was talking about chaos theory. We can actually model it. And I'm sure, I think one of your other uh, participants is, is a specific expert in that area. Um, we can model that and we should be modeling that. Um, but I think that the majority of people, once they do something like shave or go to the bus stop or station, will click back into a social script, a, a social plan, that they will just go straight back into their old behaviours. However, there's evidence at the moment that people forced into new practices are learning skills which are encouraging them and giving them the power to operate in different ways. So for instance, uh, uh, I, I was on a, 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 one of these Zoom uh, meetings with 900 people on it. And as you say, Andrew, everyone's on an equal basis. So we've got conform, uh, uh, convergent technologies that are rising out of this, which are following the patterns of a new social environment. And that's gonna make a significant difference to us. And if we get another virus within a couple of years, it's gonna reinforce that. So I think it's gonna have a major effect on our social uh, transport, uh, our meeting styles and our uh, social schemas, how we run, what we expect out of life, and where we go. But the, one of the big things that concerns me is the neurosis. It's gonna, there's gonna be a background neurosis. Now the early stages means that people are being friendlier but where will that go? Uh, one of your speakers was just talking about space on the bus or space on the train. With a neurosis factor going up like this, I think there's going to be a significant impact on how people want to travel, you know. So uh, that was my point. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just go back to Roger, Roger French? Um, you know, we can't put percentages on it, but do you think a, a large se segment of the bus sector is 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 at risk financial risk of of you know administration or whatever as a result of what's going on? Yeah, I've just read Jonathan's um, comment on, on on there, and I was just going to type a reply. I, I think the way the government have done a rescue package for um, bus companies in England, I think similar in Scotland and Wales, but certainly in England actually favours the smaller companies in the short run because they're, they're, they've assumed average costs. And uh, so they're reimbursing for the mileage being run, but lower, smaller companies will have lower costs than the PLCs. And I think the PLCs are facing a double whammy that not only have they got um, a higher than average cost base, which isn't being reimbursed by the, fully reimbursed by, by the, the DFT handout, but they've also now had seen uh, the rail, particularly first group, uh, and to a degree go ahead, although they already had a management contract with GTR. First group in particular have seen their, their returns on GWR and one or two other franchises re reduced to just 2%. And I think the problem is the city, the city analysts will say, there's no future in, in having shareholdings in first stagecoach national express and, and go ahead and i think we will see the share prices collapse over over the next few months as other 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 opportunities for investment particularly pharmaceutical companies and ventilator manufacturers become much more attractive so i think that there, we haven't seen the end of the road yet for 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 what needs to happen structurally with with the bus market and then the the, the other sector which we shouldn't really ignore because they that is the coach sector private hires, tours, and the, the people group travel. I mean, that, that at the moment, th those operators have totally packed up completely. And a lot of them are family run, there's no succession policy. And I think there are question marks as to how that market will recover. Right. Uh, has there, I know that, so in, in England, the DFT has announced this 167 million for bus companies. Has 
the Scottish government announced anything similar? Do we know? Anyone know? Maybe the guys from High Trans will know. I'm not aware. They, they've said that they will reimburse concessionary fares and uh, the, the equivalent of BSOG as at pre-COVID-19 levels, but I'm not sure they've done an equivalent handout to, as England have done for, for running the mileage that's being run. Frank, uh, up at High Trans, yeah. I'm, I'm not the bus person, so I'm not best qualified, and I think my other two colleagues have gone. Uh, but if I speak from a, from a rural point of view, um, so much is reliant, uh, the, the public transport network is so reliant on the schools network, and of course there's no schools transport. So that's how it had a major impact um, on the buses around. And the other thing is the, uh, the huge amount of uh, discretionary uh, travel from those with national concession cards. Uh, and obviously that's dropped off a cliff completely. And that is the core business for many a rural uh, transport operator. It's the freebies, the oldies that they're picking up. Mm. Um, and I'm one of them, but I don't often use a bus. Uh, so there, are, there is a real crisis, I would say, for the small, smaller operators, just as you're saying for the bigger PLCs. Interesting, interesting. Okay, um, just going through the, uh, right, there's, there's so many things to read. Um, Martin Tugwell, you're here. Do you've, you've sent something to everyone. Do you want to just say, uh, rather than me trying to spend half a second or even 10 seconds interpreting, what, what's the message? Well, I just ask, like all of us in the profession, I just ask, what would we do if we were told we could go outside as of now? Are we all content with the style of living that we've got right here, right now? And it's been made by a number of people about the fact that the vast majority of people are itching to get out. So I, I think whilst there are elements of what's changed that we want to try and capture, we mustn't be naive to think that humanity, social, we are social animals. We want to move, we want to, to experience, and that will be retained. Now the tension comes, we've just got to max out the national credit card to the ultimate extent. We're in a recession already. And so there is a tension about how do you regain the momentum within the economy whilst trying to capture some of the benefits that we've had of the different way of working now. It's a real conundrum. And I think unless we start thinking about how we would react in some of these situations, what do we want? I, I get really frustrated sometimes when we as a profession think about what everybody else should do. And let's just think about what is it that we would do in the same situation, because we are a good test of this. That's that's a very interesting point. Well said. Did, 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 um, does someone want to come back at that or, or on that point? I would have thought what Martin said there might raise a few views. I'd happily come in in strong support of it. I, I think I hear. I'm, I'm very much reminded of, of the years of my life I lost to debate on road pricing, where I had a whole bunch of people on one side falling foul of the Michael Gove test of being very expert and entirely unpersuasive. And I think there is a danger that we start thinking we can see what the answer is. But unless we can express that in a way that both plays A to the politicians, B has a business case, and then C to the people who are going to be picking up their views from the media in the weeks ahead, we're going to have some great ideas and they'll be as successful as Sir Christopher Wren's plan for rebuilding London after the Great Fire. It'll just be a bit of a mess. Right. right. Can I have a go at this one as well? Yeah. I hate to uh, contradict my old director general, um, but I mean, just to throw you're, it in. You're very welcome to be wrong, Richard, it's okay. I mean, I, mean, I, th I think the thing is, and, and this is a key one for Marty, is that the scale of this is so big that, you know, the, the, the concepts of maxing out the credit card and, and um, everything we borrow now in order to uh, get us through the crisis, we'll have to go through 20 years of austerity to pay it all back and, 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 and the kind of thinking that we uh, did deploy after 2008 I think this is so big and the, the scale of this recession is going to be so big that we, th that just won't work as a strategy and we're going to have I mean uh, we're going to have to rethink I mean the, the first thing is the Bank of England is directly monetary financing the, the government I believe I understand read that and, and um, you know, what a government bond is might have re, re, um, 
uh, you know, what government borrowing is might have to be redesigned and, and rethought. I think Lynn was speaking on this, but I, I do think that um, the idea that we, 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 we've we've had to going to get through this crisis on the credit card and we're going to have to, you know, forget the next 20 years because we're just going to be slaving away to pay it off isn't going to wash. And and this is my other point about the the the, um, the completely unequal distribution across society of who's getting a personal financial hit from this. We're all going to, as a society, have to... Uh, socialize the cost of this across everybody uh, in a fair way and and um that's a big job you know but I, i'm sure lynn might have something to say on this but um it requires deeper rethinking that than, than um let's let's get through this crisis on a credit card and then slave away for 20 years to pay that off come on. lynn over to you come on there's been a few comments there i'm sure you i'm sure you got views yeah, uh, i mean i think the main thing that strikes me from what Richard is just saying is that the mindset we're going to need to be in is a bit, like, we don't have experience of this, but it's probably a bit like the mindset that our grandparents were in as they came out of the Second World War. Um, and, you know, the whole world has been affected by this. Every country will have maxed out their credit cards the rules change. I completely agree with Richard that a sort of idea that somehow, you know, one can just sort of say, okay, so now we've all got to tighten our belts and go back to some sort of, I don't know, hyper austerity uh, doesn't work. And so we're going to need to think about a new way of, um, uh, about, I, I think big changes in society that would have been unthinkable a year ago become entirely thinkable now and probably the limitation at the moment is actually just our imagination you know we don't even know we're, we're just dipping our toes in the water we don't even begin to know the scale of those changes yet um, but I, I do think that notwithstanding Steve Gooding's point that there will be people in the treasury who are taking a kind of rather conventional view that we just have to um, it, it tighten our belts and uh, and we need to kind of get the economy motoring again, maybe literally and metaphorically. Um, I think there will be counter forces in society which will be saying, no, actually, um, this is too big to just kind of use the old tools and the old instruments. We've got to do it in a different way. So I don't really know any of the answers, but I think things are going to be different in, in a bigger way than we can even imagine at the moment. I, I just say one other much more kind of smaller thing in a way, which is I absolutely agree with some of the comments made about active travel and that Susan Claris made a comment about, you know, walking as being something that people are discovering um, at the moment. Uh, um, I think there are really big opportunities around things like 20 mile per hour speed limits, where this sort of group of doctors are now and 20 is plenty are now saying, how about a 20 mile per hour speed limit in urban areas because it would save lives right now, would reduce crashes, would reduce pressure on the NHS. That's a really smart thing to do right now, justified now by the emergency we find ourselves in, which might then go on to be something that people look at afterwards and say, yeah, that's absolutely the right thing to keep. And one other thing, which is air quality. You know, we don't know yet how many people haven't died because of the improvement in air quality, uh, because of the reduction in traffic. And I wonder whether some of the statistics that might come out on that in a months or years might give us some real pause for thought about the benefits of less traffic. And that might be quite a kind of profound sort of wake up moment for quite a lot of people. Interesting. My, my own tuppence worth is I, I kind of feel that there's going to be perhaps, perhaps more more polarization in the debate about um, behavior change and demand management. I can see people on the environmental side using um, COVID-19 episode as a, you know, a, a message, listen to the science, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to change and all this, but I can see a lot of people really reacting against it saying, you know, we've, we've tolerated this, this lockdown for three months or six months. And you're telling us now we've got to restrain ourselves again you know i so i think on that on that andrew i wonder if i might just come in and, and i think there's some real issues obviously what what steve and uh, martin were saying about what do we want to do i mean to be honest i only know what i want to do um uh, and you know which is fair enough and actually i'm 
I'm, I'm fine. But I suppose I'm, I want to take Cliff's point about that, the early adopters in the 60, 70 percent. Seriously, let's get 30 to 40 percent doing something different. That totally changes the game, how we, manages our, how we manage our streets, how we travel generally. I mean, it, it may be for worse, right? But I think so Susan's point about people, some people thinking, oh, I can walk more, those early adopters, get 10, 20 percent. You know, you take 10, 20 percent and people who are not going to do too much different, but they'll be perfectly happy now about the idea of not necessarily always going into work at exactly the same time at the most crowded time. They might still get the bus or the tube to work, but just be a little bit more flexible with some. So I think there's enough there to think, okay, again, I suppose I'm going back to my lock-in point, but actually it doesn't take too much of a reduction in capacity at, at the peak times on any of our networks to think we can run them really quite differently in the future in terms of how we allocate space. You know, we design our highway networks basically for two hours a day. You know, well, okay, well, let's not do that. Let's design it for, you know, 80% of what we are going at the moment. If we can do that, if we can get peak spreading at all on any of our public transport systems, and Roger is a better place than, than I am to comment about that, you think, well, that is a real opportunity to change things. It doesn't require everybody to change their lifestyles anywhere close to that. But to actually get better for everybody that, that, that wants to do these things, it does, probably only does take a 10, 20, 30% off the top thing. So there's a, I think there's a real opportunity there. And notwithstanding the fact that I'm sure loads of people are bursting just to get back to normal. And I, I, I get that too. But enough to, to an, an enable us to make a real difference, which is why my, I suppose I made my point about locking in. Because if we don't exploit that opportunity now, it would be much more likely that we'll, you know, and, and, and actually on the other hand, Cliff is saying, I think Cliff's a good point about this. What, you think that's the last one of these we're going to have? Um, so uh, anyway, there, there's a, I think there's enough opportunity there without expecting us all to change our lifestyles. I really do. Mm. Um, is it possible to make a comment? Yes, sure. Um, it strikes me that peak spreading is highly relevant to the highways budget because less than 10% is required as a reduction to avoid the, the peaks. And that would mean that the vast majority of the proposals to increase uh, capacity around junctions and so on would no longer be required. And that money uh, could be spent in other ways, particularly on public transport and active travel. So it seems to me that um, we've all learned how to do this and to well, I agree entirely that it won't be applied all the time. But all you need to do is knock down by 10 percent and suddenly you freed up vast amounts of cash. Right, that's a very interesting observation. Um, David Metz. David, I don't know if you're there. I'm here, hi. Hi, I mean, your background is also uh, kind of some sort of medical uh, background as well, isn't it? And, and uh, yes. you, you, you've, you've, got, you've made a, a message to me. Do you want to just explain? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm following, as we all are, the, uh, the, the, the epidemic. And what is deeply impressive is the modelling epidemic uh, expertise that's been brought to bear in the UK and in many other countries and it's open it's collaborative it's transparent people are sharing code and we can see how this inputs the government decisions now I think we need the same thing on the transport side um, the modeling mostly is quite obscure it's not transparent it's not open the national transport model that the department operates is not open to others to use it, it's not transparent, uh, and it's probably quite obsolete now because it was built in an era uh, before concerns about carbon. So I think we need a new, a new generation of models, collaborative, open, crowdsourced, that we can all understand, and then they would be the basis for developing uh, our policies, and we would have a debate about the impact of different inputs uh, but I think we need a break in past, pra in past practice with transport modelling. We need a, a new future. Well, I haven't seen so many people nod their heads to any other statement so far today. <laughs> <laughs> the, does anyone have a comment back on that? Roger Geffen, you, you're there. Did, did you have a comment on that or do you want to make a comment on things generally? Oh, can't hear you, Roger. Sorry, Roger, having difficult hearing. Ah, yeah, um, that's, better. that's better. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so yes, so the, the national transport model has long been the bane, for, I think, of ever, lots of our existences. And from a cycling point of view, um, it's been uh, sorry to say I'm from Cycling UK. From our point of view, it's been it, it's been not it, it's been the opposite of predict and provide. It's been predict that 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 cycling will will decline and therefore not provide for cycling because all those actually if. Um, all those extra cycle facilities won't won't be used by lots of cyclists because actually cycle use is predicted by the NTM to decline, and therefore uh, any cycle facilities will just get in the way of those 40% extra motorists who, who will be there in 2040 or whatever the model is now saying. So absolutely, a crowdsourced uh, accountable model that actually reflects, um, you know, that can be used to investigate different policy options rather than merely tells you what's what's likely to happen according to some economic assumptions that seem to be very questionable. Um, both as what will happen and what's desirable. Let me just go back though, because um, uh, you know, Colin was asking about implications for active travel, what's happening anecdotally, and uh, and um, John has been talking about locking in the you know the, the, the changes. Uh, anecdotally, yes, we're hearing a lot about people taking up cycling. People, you know, care workers, health workers taking up cycling as the only viable way of getting around um, when when they can't use public transport. Um, we don't have good data on this yet. It's one of the frustrations that cycle use being a relatively low use mode. We we get we get relatively poor data that's you know where the fluctuations can be difficult to you know random fluctuations can be dis, uh, difficult to distinguish from real trends. Um, we you know we've been urging DFT to sort of get the data on this quickly, but we've also been saying to DFT and to and to the cities. Given the number of newcomers taking up cycling in the current crisis, it would be well worth putting in some protected cycle lanes using little bollards that are quite often being used now in, for, for, you know, to create, keep cycle lanes open during roadworks and are sometimes used for, uh, for other temporary infrastructure. They can be installed very quickly and cheaply. Uh, they can be formalized later. You can see straight away during the current crisis what is, what is the demand for them. Um, and by creating conditions where people actually get to experience cycling in protected cycle lanes rather than sort of um, out there in, 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 um, without those protections, um, we give people a real opportunity to sort of say, well, actually, maybe this really is a, uh, one of those changes that um, I'd like to keep rather than one of those changes really that I want to get away from as quickly as possible. Um, and by installing them, while while pressures on road space and 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 particularly parking space are greatly reduced, it means that they can go in, they can be installed with far, far less disruptively than would happen if you're trying to uh, install them in 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 the course of our normal traffic jam. So we're we're very keen to sort of see that that change. You know, that is one form of locking in that we would very much like to see. I absolutely take the points that people made about you know there will be some things that people will not want to. Will not want to retain. After all, we didn't retain after the Second World War. We didn't retain the benefits for many people of a much better diet and a much more evenly distributed um, distribution of food. That didn't mean we decided we wanted to keep it. Uh, so let's not be overly optimistic about people's desire to keep keep more positive changes. We are going to have to push for them. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I was just looking down the the oh did I see Emma? Did you want to say something? Yeah, Emma, tell me who Hello. you are first. Hi, I'm Emma Griffin, uh, uh, London Living Streets and at Action Vision Zero. And I get yeah, just to add to Roger's point. Um, yeah, similarly, space for cycling, also low traffic neighbourhoods. This is the time to put some temporary, very quick measures in, quick and dirty, and get it and get stuff in there now to embed this um, to embed walking from your house 20 minutes on 20 minutes on 20 minute walks not from your house um and, and also going to the point about local shopping again specifically focusing on on shopping streets where people are going out to buy their things putting a little bit more space where they can queue comfortably i know in my local street there's um there's there's just not enough space for everyone to get in i've got someone else joining me here <laughs> <laughs> that's fine <laughs> yeah. that's nice Okay, yeah, so, so messages that things can be done now to try and lock in some of these benefits. I'm just wondering whether councils can actually put in stuff at the moment. I mean, most councils presumably aren't allowed allowing work for <coughs> streets, are they? Well, well, there is, I mean, I guess there's temporary traffic orders that could go in and, it, and, and experimental traffic orders take a little bit longer, but there are things, and I think it's possible. We're talking to some councils at the moment. It, it's not impossible. It, the, 
in terms of the, of the cycling infrastructure, bollards can be put up instantly, and they know this when there's construction works. You put something down, create space, and, and I know Roger will have more information on that. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot more that could be done, and other cities around the world are doing it. So I think a lot could be learned in places like Berlin, Budapest, Bogota. Um, that is going in right now. Let's let's be brave. I think. I should just have said that quite a lot of United States and Canadian, a number of Canadian cities are putting in, and, and others, Berlin, I believe, is putting in quite a lot of the temp, kind of temporary infrastructure that I was talking about. I guess the bollards need to just be about two metres apart and then all is well. Okay. What about going back to big infrastructure, HS2 roads programme? Do people think that um, there should be a, these things should be revisited? Uh, who, who wants to say something there? Is Martin Tugwell still with us? Oh, maybe he's just gone. I would think and that. And would think that. Yeah, go ahead. Who ever wants to go? Andrew, I would think the uh, capacity issue, which has been the argument for HS2 in, in recent times, that surely has to be brought into question because of the uh, aspects we're looking at now. For example, the rise and rise of, of Zoom and, and other things. So I, I, I would have thought it and the state of the economy, I would have thought it will have to be reviewed. Right. Does anyone think it will actually be reviewed, though? Um, Andrew, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that RIS2 was published a fortnight before the DFT decarbonisation plan document, and the two of them are so completely incompatible with one another that I think... You know, even if we didn't have COVID-19, RIS2 is going to have to be reviewed. Um, we, we've just been doing a piece of work, which isn't out yet, but we've been looking at what the carbon impact of the roads program would be compared to any sort of sensible Paris compliance carbon budget for the strategic road network. And, you know, over the next decade, we're probably talking about RIS2 eating up maybe about a tenth of what a sensible carbon budget for the strategic road network might look like. So there are some uh, non-COVID related reasons why RIDS2 is a big problem, but, but the COVID pandemic gives a justification for cutting funding for something that otherwise is going to become one hell of a big embarrassment for DFT as the spotlight turns increasingly on transport as the sector that has got to tackle its failure to address climate change. Could I just add a quick point to that one? The other argument that might be made for big investment is the job creation potential of big investment, to which I would counter by saying that actually there's good evidence that investing in, in, in support care infrastructure such as high facilities generates not only greater benefit in terms of cost, the conventional cost benefit analysis, but also in terms of job creation per pound spent. It's, it's better value for money on that account too than big project projects. Colin, Colin Black, you, you've um, just kind of raised the question. Do you have any thoughts yourself on the big infrastructure issue? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, Hi. Hi, Colin. Yeah, well, obviously at Arcadis, we um, are very much uh, engaged with those big infrastructure programs and there's a lot of discussion around how um, the decarbonisation is, is going to impact infrastructure and just really, I think, uh, all businesses are, are looking for, for more certainty and, and guidance as to, to which direction uh, government policy is going and, and how, where we should be positioning future uh, business investment. I think uh, uh, at this stage, it, it's really, really tough. We keep kind of uh, going through a period of uh, uh, full steam ahead, uh, uh, press pause, and that creates real challenges for a, a, a business that is really looking to, to deliver the, to those priorities that the, the government sets. So coming back to us, that, that point we made earlier about work, needing to work more hand in glove with the public sector, that really means giving um, businesses much clearer guidance on where it sees its future priorities and, uh, and, and helping to, uh, us to understand uh, where it wants to, uh, to, to prioritise its future investment. Right, interesting. Okay, thanks. And um, Steve Gooding, you, I think you, you'd like to say something on this. Well, I, I, I doubt very much whether 
uh, in this company, we're going to come to a consensus view on the bet noirs of, of uh, wildlife, uh, high speed two, Heathrow three, lower Thames crossing. I just want to sound a note of caution on something like RIS2, or did you just put a thought out there for others to think about, which is much of what we at the foundation welcome in RIS2 was a recognition that the performance metrics needed further work, that what we actually wanted Highways England to achieve needed to be better expressed, that we got to shape up a square up to the fact that a lot of our national network was built in the 60s and 70s of stuff that is literally, if not falling apart, moving apart. And a lot of the provision for the five year period is about maintenance, it's about capital renewal. And in talking about RIS2, I think I just caution everyone to be a bit more um, scrupulous about where we're talking about adding capacity and where we're talking about making sure that we've got a network that's fit for purpose. I also think, by the way, that everything we've been saying about more active travel and more active travel locally is going to put an ever increasing spotlight, not just on the condition of the local carriageway, but the local footway. Um, I have watched other people strolling to the shops and strolling back and I've watched them trip over. And I, it worries me that um, certainly I wouldn't want to be going up or down the street where I live in the carriageway on an electric micro scooter, like uh, apparently people want me to do because those little wheels are going to get caught out by the cracks in the highway. So we've got to really focus on those two things. Enhancement, let's have the debate, but also let's have the debate about making sure we've got a network that's fit for purpose. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, I have had a, 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 a message just from, um, from um, my boss, Peter Stonham. You want to say something, don't you? Um, can I, I, am I on to this, Tom? So. Yeah, you're on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, it's been a great discussion and we're um, over half, well, nearly half an hour over time. Uh, I noticed the numbers at peak, if anybody's doing the data tracking, Jonathan, uh, the peak number of participants was 48 and we're now down to 31. I'm learning as I go with Zoom. I'm not in the least keen to stop it but I, I'm just alerting my uh, host, uh, Andrew, to the fact that um, we're probably in the uncharted territory as far as the original program was concerned. Um, I don't know how we take a straw, po straw poll on continuing in what way, but um, I think we probably put some limit on it. I, I loved your analogy to uh, After Dark. Uh, that was alcohol fueled if i remember <laughs> <laughs> the drinks are on who's the drinks on this time round? oh well anybody can have a drink in here now if they could come round. um <laughs> it was uh, i think the famous one was oliver reed under the table about three in the morning too. anyway carry on if well, i i was going to suggest that i probably need to go and edit a few pages yeah. but if, if peter you want to take <clears throat> over i'm happy for that well, there's one thing i would, i mean if you don't mind I'm, i'd just love to thank you andrew uh, i'm glad you said what you said about it being more fun than editing the made because we might have to redeploy you to do <laughs> this more often and if you're keen that's fantastic um you've done a wonderful job and uh, i'd like to show my appreciation in the, the usual way yeah. i won't want a round of applause or dustbin lids banging that's later but uh, many thanks andrew for doing well, thank you thank you for all the participants it's, it's been really i've thoroughly enjoyed it and i think the other thing i the only other thing I'd say is it has thrown up some topics for future um, discussions, actually, um, you know, RIS2, climate issues, whatever. So I, okay. I might exit now, but good luck to everyone else. Thank you. Have a great Easter. Yeah. Bye. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> so so my, my little bit here is to say that I did allow in the program for a semi-sociable bit at the end. I can see the numbers going down now. It was you, Andrew, they were watching. Um, uh, but I just thought it was good to invite one or two people to contribute their own professional, personal experiences of, of operating in this lockdown environment and using things like Zoom and, and conference calls, etc. cetera. Um, are you still with us, Keith? Yeah, hi. Keith, just, you, you did say some interesting things earlier about how this was affecting your professional life. Could you? go somewhere on that and also that drinking session you've had online <laughs> <laughs> yeah no there's been a bit of that um certainly we've 
um, we moved uh, in, as a UK organisation from having 1,700 people sitting behind desks to 1,700 people working remotely in two days. Uh, you know, we've been in a position where culturally the idea of remote working has never re seemed to be the right time or, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, because you have to do it, you just do it and two days later, here you are. Um, uh, uh, and actually, culturally, we have an issue at the moment um, <coughs> that I have to request the bandwidth in order to have video on this because globally there's 17,000 people, once North America come online, all trying to use the, the network. So there are different things that you have to get used to. Um, what, what I did, uh, there was just one thing I was sort of saving up to say at the end, and I am going to have to move on, but I just wanted to say this perhaps in response to some of the comments about um, over optimism about change. Um, uh, Martin Tugwell, who talked about, you know, what do we want to do, uh, and many other comments about, you know, what, what, what the economic um, consequences of all of this are and how we can't. You know, uh, you know, we would need to change things in order to have a different economic outcome. I suppose what I would just want to point out is that the economy is made up of a number of people, uh, organisations and businesses who are working here and decisions are not necessarily always made in government that make changes, but are made in the boardrooms of all of these businesses about how they want to work. And um, we are definitely already seeing different decisions being made by business. And uh, I think we would be missing a trick if we are not looking at the behaviors of commercial businesses who are now finding that there are better commercial ways of operating that actually suit the climate outcomes that we're after. And that those two things are, are now not necessarily in conflict, but, but maybe more complementary than previously they were and that's the opportunity I'm looking to try and find you know that the, the the overlap of the Venn diagram about where there is common interest in uh, creating new ways of working that mean new way, new transport systems can work and new ways of retail can work uh, and we get the right direction of movement towards the climate outcomes that we're after. And, and, and so for me, it's not about over-optimism. It's about a completely pragmatic look at not just personal behaviour, not just government behaviour, but the behaviour of the commercial world and what it sees as being an opportunity to change that it didn't have before. Thanks. Um, I think Cliff might be interested in that, and I can imagine a a further discussion there. Um, I'm just trying to tease out one or two things that are worth another session of an hour in a week or two. Um, we're down under 20 now, so I'm going to grab what I can uh, when I can. Anybody see a, another topic? What, can I, can I report on a quick survey? Yeah. Um, uh, we've just. Oh, Robert, a... Robert Huxford, sorry. Yeah. Hi, um, so I'm director of the Urban Design Group. We've done a, a very quick survey of Urban Design Group practices. So these are master planners, uh, planning consultancies, design consultancies. Um, it looks as though uh, at the moment about a third of them um, reckon that they will have their working patterns permanently changed by this experience. Um, so what, what that means is that the journey to work is going to be fundamentally different. It's going to be, it's not going to exist for um, those particular types of working practice. Um, so one discussion point would be um, if the working practices change, how that impacts on travel demand. Um, I mean, there's, there's been discussions about teleworking that go back decades and the focus has been on the journey to work and how that uh, relieves radial routes um, but it comes at uh, the complication of people doing more distributed journeys. Um, they stay at home. Um, if they're impelled to, to, to go and, and move, um, they do it from a local basis and not necessarily on, along the lines of an established public transport network. So that's uh, the first point. The second is about working practices. Um, they are, the, the consultancies are, are saying that in terms of management time, it's taking a lot more time to manage an online team. 
so maybe 20 to 30 percent increased time um, it's not as though you can pass somebody's desk make a quick comment and move on um, the zoom meeting seems to be uh, occupying a lot of people's time so two points there land use working patterns implications for the transport system and just the practicalities thank you that's helpful uh, could I encourage John Gallery to say a word about the tourism industry? Because dom domestic tourist attractions must be looking forward to a summer season, must be really hurting right now. Richard, I was just going to do that. I, I'm not lying. I, would, I thought John's still here and he hasn't said anything. And you're coming from another place in the world, John. Are you here? I'm still here. I was writing a report in the background, so I stayed out of sight. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I mean, just to introduce, John John works in the tourism and travel field, and, and most of our discussions about transport don't have the word travel at the beginning. John's a whole existence is built around people enjoying themselves and going out and visiting things, which is being completely shot through now. Um, can you give us a take on how things might emerge as we come out of this? Well, aside from the current difficulties people are having, it's... Um it's obviously trying to get through this first phase, if you like, of uh, the challenge of, of no business at all, which is what everyone I'm working with has a situation. You know, hotels, attractions, they're all shut, so there's no income. Um, and it's hard for them to do, to do make decisions about what, what might happen to them in the future. So uh, put that to one side for a moment. There, there will be a future um, for us, I suppose, once we're out of lockdown and people start traveling again and I do think it will bring in different ways of thinking people will start to think twice about where they're traveling and they'll want to do it more meaningfully I'm, I'm sure there's, there's going to be some good out of this because people uh, I think are showing their mettle when it comes to volunteering for example for the NHS you know, how many people have done that I'm, I'm sure a number of you may have done that but uh, those kind of attitudes uh, will come through, I think, and it, it'll, it'll emerge in tourism. Maybe it'll accelerate um, other things as well, like uh, technological things, like the uh, electric cars or vehicles, or whatever. So I think there's, there's definitely got to be hope still. It's just um, we're all in a little bit of a negative period at the moment. Right. Well, I mean, you know I wear another hat, um, John, in the travel and... Uh leisure field we might might put one of these together for that if you're interested yeah i'm hoping to have a travel section in my event in uh, well we've postponed an event that was meant to be in april to june could still be delayed after june as well of course but uh, we are going to include travel in that when we're talking about the events industry and how the events industry uh, has its impact on on industry generally you know events events themselves uh, are valuable in, va in in economic terms but the the actual business done at events is also the additional val value that people have and transport comes into that in a big way because people have to get to those big events or small events and uh, flying might not be the thing to do anymore it'll be about uh, having more of these kind of events well also the the, the tourism this is industry my third one today by the way on, on zoom so i'm getting used to this uh, the tourism industry is always banging the drum about his its uh, economic benefits and uh, i'm sure we'll hear a lot more about uh, industries saying you've got to help us restart because we're a motor of the economy you know and and it does drive travel demand once you yeah, yeah. okay thanks for your contribution thank you um, we're really down to the hardcore now not it's the, the, the dozen left um anybody has another go this is now your time because um the band space is available anybody want to alert me to their wish to contribute i think waving's probably good now because there's uh, I can get most of you on screen. Um, Steve Gooding, again. Steve, this is your number three one. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I shan't, well, I've spoken a lot, so I won't say a great deal. I, I almost think that uh, you could restart the conversation and, in a sense, it's going once people have managed to reflect on the things they've heard today. I'm absolutely with the folk who said, some businesses are going to take a very hard business look at this and something I'd be interested in is perhaps getting a, a couple of well, some of the people who've spoken today but just, just to say a bit more if you look at the change in travel and you look at the business opportunities and you think hard about how much you're paying for your city centre rents 
what on earth is that going to mean for city centres? What on earth is that going to mean for the Ministry of Housing Fair Funding Review if um, high-end rents for office premises collapse? Uh, I just think that um, there are secondary effects here we might usefully want to pick up, which again, a lot of this is going to play into transport. It's not necessarily going to be transport-led, but I think it's all very interesting stuff and a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Cliff, while you're still here, you, um, the, picking up on boardroom rethinks, boardroom reviews of, of future plans, um, it's not easy. It's a very private environment. I mean, how does one, I mean, Keith indicated a little bit about what was happening in his company and his clients. Um, have you got any techniques to get a handle on this stuff? Sorry, are you talking to me, Peter? I didn't I hear did. it. Sorry, I said Cliff, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I apologise. Um, yeah, the, the boardroom is a, a political, you know, background of, you know, normally. And in this situation, there's a lot of neurosis in the, in the boardrooms. So what people are looking for is an easy way out. I, I just, can I just make a comment I've been dying to make? Yeah, yeah. We've got convergent technology out there. It, it's just about timing. I'm, I'm fascinated. Because we've got this fifth generation comms coming out and the, all the people like Zoom and GoToMeeting are trying to improve their uh, offering. As soon as we've got Always On, which is a process where everybody can get instant access by voice control, then a lot of this is going to accelerate. And I just wanted to make that point. So uh, the boards are either advanced uh, risk takers or can I get back to what I was? Now, you know what happens. If if people uh, stay with what they've got, it ain't break, don't fix it sort of uh, attitude, then eventually they die out. But for a while they survive, while the early adopters, a lot of them die out because they're taking high risks. But eventually some of the early adopters or the ones just behind the early adopters start to succeed if they've got a good commercial sense. Now, Peter, you're an example. You know, within a, a couple of weeks, you've gone from paper to online. Uh, so, you know, people like yourself will make best use of this. And it's not chaotic, but the outcome, the emergent result of this is something that we'll become aware of within the next few months. So right now, it's virtually impossible to say how deep it will go. My guess is it will be back up to the same system you know, by about 80% of it at least within six months. Okay, uh, I think we'll have a, uh, I did mention to you that we might bring you back in another uh, uh, forum to have a chat about adoption curves and change management and all that stuff. Um, yeah. A few that people have raised today, and we might, we might put that on the table for a week or so. Um, are you still here, Jonathan Raper? I think he's making tea. Uh, he's showing, but not... Um, if you're here, Jonathan, um, you're, a, you're a kind of hard-headed business thinker. If you've got anything to say on the same lines, I'd be interested. Oh, he's left his machine on, but he's not here. Um, right, I, I think we've, we're, we're fizzling out. Um, if I said thank you to everybody who participated, I'm missing about 30 people. So uh, I'll have to do that later. Um, but I, I think it's been fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this uh, nice point to make, Cliff, about adoption. And I, I was sceptical about this. I've never done a Skype in my life. Um, and people said, look, we've got to do things online. And I, I said, show me how it works. And I joined in a Zoom and I thought, this is good. Um, and we picked up some te techniques from other meetings I've been in. And I think we've even tried a few new ones today ourselves. And I. I can think of a capability that doesn't exist for Zoom, and I might be suggesting that my techie guy uh, does it as a plug-in because um, I don't think it's in the kit, uh, toolkit yet, but I can see a need for something today that we haven't actually had available. Um, so I'd just like to thank, uh, in absentia, uh, the panellists who are not still with us. Um, certainly the, the two are uh, Peter and Cliff. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I'd like to thank Andrew in absentia for his great 
uh, chairing and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and the other 37 who've gone for doing so too and um, we will be back uh, I, I will learn from this experience if anybody wants to drop me any notes on how they think uh, another session could be even better than this one uh, I'd be pleased to hear from you or, or to contribute uh, ideas about your own participation leading discussions uh, Roger, I, 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 the bus discussion that you raised is, is fascinating. We're going to have a 10% club online soon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Next meeting. Okay, fantastic. Well, that was good material, and you got a bit more from other people today, which is, yeah, which is good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank okay, you. well, um, I'm going to put up the test card now <laughs> and play yeah. the um, closing. Uh, credits uh, and uh, theme tune uh, that'll be next time um, lovely to be in conversation with you all um, thanks and goodbye <laughs>